Hello? Is that loud enough? I, I'm sure I can be heard, but is that mic loud enough for everybody else? Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. DeMeo, for all those who uh, I haven't met, and uh, I play a fairly minor role here. I'm going to be uh, basically a devil's advocate. Uh, when we get to question answer, I'll be throwing in my two cents here and there. Um, we'll be talking about uh, bracing during this session, and, uh, and the reason I, I, I mention uh, my playing devil's advocate is that, that while we're going to have presentations on a couple of types of braces, um, I, I, I'll state my opinion that, that I, I don't think it's going to be the factual information that you hear that is going to be the most valuable. Um, to me, the most valuable thing that you could get out of this session is being a critical thinker about bracing issues. So if you can learn um, how to think from the biomechanical standpoint and how to think how bracing affects your biomechanics and how that will affect your function and then, then weigh uh, cost-benefit and start looking at things from that orientation uh, and, and critically thinking that way, that, that then we certainly would have done our job. And, and so uh, this, unlike some sessions where um, you, know, you receive a bit of information and make a decision, um, and, and it's, it's, it's unlikely that any of you should listen to a piece of information and say, ah, that is my solution. I would discourage you from doing that. Now, if you hear information and you see examples of how that was helpful for someone else and think that someone seems similar to you, then think about that reasoning potentially being something that applies to you. Okay, so those, and, and that's going to be my job is to kind of keep that flowing. So I'm going to look for reasons to disagree with people, both with the speakers and with, with individuals, and I want you all to be doing that as well. So that'll be my role here. Um, uh, where our speakers, we're going to have some brief comments from um, uh, Dr. Marty Uhlberg, um, we'll, which will be a bit of an introduction to uh, bracing issues. Uh, and then uh, Marmaduke Loke uh, from Dynamic Bracing Solutions will be speaking. Um, and then Dennis uh, Richards from Townsend Design. Uh, and, and we do have a third speaker from uh, Hangar, uh, Mike Neer, who I presume isn't here because he's not up here yet. So maybe we had a plane delay or something. but. He's uh, missing an action. If he comes, then we'll introduce him. So without further ado, Dr. Yulberg, adieu, Dr. Yulberg. At one of the first PHI conferences I attended, Dr. Jacqueline Perry described the ideal brace this way, and it's always stuck in my head. One, it does what we need it to do, so it makes up for lost function. Two, it weighs nothing. Three, it's invisible. And four, it costs nothing. <laughs> Wouldn't we all love to have a brace that met all those criteria? There's been some progress towards these ideals. Designs are better at doing what they would need to do. There are lighter materials available. And there, some designs are more cosmetic than the old metal and leather that some of us remember. But there are none that weigh nothing, there's none that are invisible, and there's none that cost nothing. So there's several challenges ahead for the orthotic profession. I'd like to share some information to those of you who may be wearing some type of brace or those of you who are possibly going to be a brace user in the future, so that you are better co informed consumers of these services. And I'll start with some definitions, but first, when I was growing up, the person who evaluated me, measured me, made the brace, and fit me with the brace was Mr. Erickson, the brace man. Um, now some of the orthotic professionals are women, so we can't use the term brace man. And now there's a whole list of possible orthotic professionals that you might be dealing with. And some of you may know these terms and some of you may not. A certified orthotist, a CEO, deals mostly with bracing. And that can be legs, spine, trunk, and sometimes arms. A certified prosthetist, CP, deals mostly with artificial limbs. 
And then there are folks who are uh, dually certified, certified prosthetist, orthodist, or CPO. And they can do both bracing and artificial limbs, although they may choose to sort of specialize in one versus the other. Of our speakers that are here now, Dennis is a CEO, Marmaduke is a CPO. I think probably m many of you are not aware of what kind of education orthodists have. Until recently, it w they required a bachelor's degree. The new graduates in the last year or two must complete a master's program plus one year of residency training working with um, or an orthotist or a prosthetist, one year if it's a single discipline like orthotics or prosthetics, 18 months of residency for CPOs, and then they must pass a certifying exam. There also are, and you may work, be working with an orthotic or prosthetic assistant, and this is their educational background that's required, a high school diploma, GED, or college degree, three semesters each of human anatomy, general physics, and medical terminology, and 12 to 18 months of clinical experience under the supervision of a CO, CP, or CPO, and pass the certification exam. A few of you may also be working with a podorthist, a CPED, these people deal primarily with feet and shoes, so they frequently will make foot orthotics and also work, possibly work with you in terms of the interface between the brace and the shoes. And this is their requirements for education. There are two certifying boards. The ABC, the American Board for Certification in Orthotics, Prosthetics, and Podorthics and the BOC, Board of Certification, so you may see some of these initials, particularly the BOC, after people's names on their cards. 17 states have state licensure and regulation, the rest do not. Missouri does not have state licensure requirements, California does not have state licensure requirements, and Colorado does not. If there is no state licensure, the brace person may or may not have met the educational experience and or examination requirements. They may be perfectly competent, and also folks who are certified or licensed may not necessarily meet your needs, but it gives you some basis of judging their education and their experience, their training. Some more terms, and that you may hear some of these uh, used by the professionals um, sometimes Orthodists and prosthetists are almost as bad as doctors about using medical ease. So AFO is ankle foot orthosis, or what in the old days we called a short leg brace. And it can be many designs, and I'll show some pictures of some, some possible, but not all of the designs. A KFO, or knee ankle foot orthosis, the old term was long leg brace. A KO, knee orthosis, only goes around the knee, so not down into the foot. HKFO, hip, knee, ankle, foot orthosis, or a long leg brace extending above the hip. So you can sort of get the gist of this. The, the initials are related to which joints it covers. There also are, is DAFO, or dynamic ankle foot orthosis, which is an AFO with some energy storing and releasing capacity, and how much of that is present is variable. And then, any guesses of what a UFO is? <laughs> it's not unidentified flying object. For the purpose of this, it's un unidentified flying orthosis, which is what happens when you get really, really frustrated <laughs> with the device you... <clears throat> <laughs> so, if someone was going to recommend to you that you have, get a short leg brace, an AFO, the primary purpose and functions of them, uh, and there may be some others, but these are the most common, correct foot drop, 
keep you from tripping over your toe, support an unstable ankle or foot, and some designs can provide variable amounts of knee support. This are some pictures of various AFOs. On the left is one that you pro many of you will recognize. Um, the old metal and leather. On the right, the plastic or the polypropylene. Some AFOs have ankle joints. Some have solid ankles. Um, some are leather lace-up. Um, in Colorado, actually, a lot of people, a lot of men wear cowboy boots uh, that I call the poor man, Western man's AFO. And then there are some carbon fiber. Um, on the left, some of the off-the-shelf that come in sort of small, medium, large. Um, on the right, uh, carbon fiber custom AFO. Now for KFOs, the purpose and functions are the AFO portion can provide the functions of the AFO if you have foot drop and weak knee. Sometimes the AFO portion is also there because the KOs, the knee orthosis, depend on you having a nice round calf to help hold it up. And if you have a lot of atrophy of your calf muscles, a KO is just going to drop down and become an ankle brace <laughs> um, and not stay up. And so the AFO portion is a way of keeping it in the position it needs to be. Uh, primarily, KFOs are recommended to support weak knee muscles and prevent the knee from buckling or to limit hyperextension. They also can support or limit knee deformity, so either the tendency of the knee to go in, knock knee, kind of positioning or out genuverum bow leg position or and or hyperextension. Again with KFOs there's many materials and designs. They can be metal and leather. Um, I only have two pictures here. On the left is one with a locked knee joint and with what we call a bail lock which lets you back, unlock it to sit down by backing up against a chair and releasing it. And then there are stance control knee joints and many designs, which are the purpose, the design is to lock the knee when you're putting weight on it and to unlock it when you're getting ready to swing the leg forward or will unlock when you go to sit down and you don't have to manually release. So to be an informed orthotic consumer, I think it's important for you to ask and know the credentials of the professionals that you're consulting with. Have an understanding of your own anatomy, including deformities, range of motion, muscle strength, because there's some braces have certain requirements, like a number of them say you need to have at least a grade three hip flexor to be able to use it well. Ask questions in order to understand what the device can do, what it can't do, how it works, and possibly even um, some simple maintenance. Um, when I had a plastic and metal brace with a double ankle joint and springs in it, I broke a spring a week. And the orthodist wanted me to come back to get the spring replaced. Of course, they're only open nine to five, Monday through Friday, which is the same hours that I'm working. And so after a long time, I was finally able to convince them to sell me, give me some springs, and let me fix it myself. Um, you need to understand what the costs are, the likely insurance coverage, possibly even if you have an HMO, how that limits which orthotist you can go to, um, co-pays um, in advance, and other ancillary costs. Am I going to need a different size shoe? different size shoes, am I going to need a buildup on the shoe, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my basic introduction, and uh, I'll let Marmaduke speak next.
need to change out our uh, computer. Richard, are you going to be using a PowerPoint? Do you want to talk while we uh, change? That way, be a good. Uh, Station identification here. Okay, uh, one of the things I want to show is that there is new hope for people with polio. Some of the things that we've done with new bracing methods and techniques and designs are proving to be uh, overwhelming uh, uh, great benefits for polio survivors. And one of the things that we started doing is instead of just making braces, we're now looking for a comprehensive solution development. As you know, polio has been around for a while. Dr. Perry, about five, six years ago, spent a lot of time with me down in San Diego. And she saw me at Abilities Expo, and she came into my booth. And I just shut down my booth, and I just spent all my time with Dr. Perry. And she was asking me question after question after question for about an hour. And I'm waiting for her to turn and tear my head off. If, if you know Dr. Perry, she will, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, an orthodist, a, a PT, or an orthopedic surgeon, she would tear into you if you did not know your stuff. So then she started coming down to San Diego and spending days with me and trying to learn more and more about what I'm, what I'm doing. And this was one of the best compliments that uh, I think I've ever received and uh, you know, from her. <clears throat> I've been in this field for 40 years. Next month, July 1st, will be 40 years to the date. Um, and I was working at Children's Hospital at that time, and I used to help an orthotist every Monday afternoon at the Brace Clinic. And when I decided this is what I want to do, I had a passion for it, I wanted to do it, the orthotist, who was a great guy, spent three and a half hours trying to talk me out of it. And I am so glad that I said, no, this is what I want to do. So I, uh, I, I pursued it, and I'm, I'm certainly glad I did. My Aunt Helen had polio, and as a little boy, I always wondered why no one could help her walk better. And she, but she, was, she had a perpetual smile and laugh, and she was just one of the happiest people I've ever, ever known. <clears throat> In 1984, I probably, this day in 1984, I probably had one of the most life-changing things for my, you know, for my career. I got an 82-year-old gentleman to run with a prosthesis. My next patient was a 40-year-old polio survivor in great shape that was just starting to come down with the early effects of post-polio syndrome. He started to have the drop foot, and I go, okay, I, I fit my best AFO at that time, and I could get that, I could not get this 40-year-old guy that was in a much better shape to do half of what I could do with that 82-year-old gentleman. I said, what is wrong with this picture? What are we doing wrong here? What are we doing right on one side of the equation and wrong on the other side? So I looked, and, and the more I looked was that we've already figured it out on the prosthetic side. In orthotics, what we're taught is, uh, I, I, I think it's all wrong, or majority of it is all wrong. But a polio survivor has sensation to the ground and an amputee does not. So there are things that there's, like this person with, with 40 years old should have been able to outdo that 82 year old gentleman uh, altogether. So that really changed my life. And I chose to take a new path. I started looking for answers. And even in school, 
I had an innate sense to go, that's good, that's junk. And unfortunately, there were too many things on the junk side that I saw. And so when I started designing or looking for solutions, I said, is that what I'd want to wear? And the answer was always no. I said, is that what my Aunt Helen would want to wear? The answer was always no. Is that what I'd want to put on I, 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 any, any family member or whatever? And I said, well, what would I want? And Dr. Perry had probably the closest definition uh, to that. So braces, really, the metal leather, really haven't changed since the 1800s. I felt that all the concepts were wrong for the most part, and they were too simplified. Orthotics, people wearing braces are far more complex than prosthetic side. Prosthetics is actually easy, and that's why a lot of people gravitate to that. It's more lucrative, and it's easier. I always went to the side that had less money and was harder. I, was, I always liked the challenge. And I found that every, there's, I've never met two polio survivors that were ever the same. Everyone has a unique puzzle to figure out. What do we have to solve for that individual? So the complexities, if you start looking at you know, amputee, you basically have three major kinds. You're congenital, you're born with it, you're vascular, and then traumatic. On the orthotic side, you have the congenitals, you have the, uh, you know, any type of neuromuscular disease. Uh, all kinds of vascular trauma, but there, there's a plethora. I mean, it goes on for hundreds and hundreds of reasons why people wear uh, braces. So then I started looking, okay, we got to develop solutions. And when I worked in that children's hospital, one of the things I did was I gate trained kids every day. And I noticed that when I would hand somebody off, a, 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 someone with a brace, I assumed that, I said, go back to your physical therapist and get trained. I assumed that they knew exactly what to do with the mechanics I designed into it. And I found out that wasn't true. And so then we know what we're planning into it. We know the mechanics and, so, and then what has to come out of it. So when I develop a solution, I am developing a standing, a walking, and running solution, running for some people. I got the first wounded warrior with a paralyzed limb to go back into full active duty and even go back into a war zone leading a company of infantry soldiers. He is still wearing that same brace, running, jumping, and everything else today after six years. Here's some happy <laughs> candidates here. <clears throat> so the assessment, I found my assessment for what I learned in school was very simplified, and so then I started, oh, geez, I gotta learn every detail about this person. What do I need? I need, and, and so I try to get manual muscle testing from every physical therapist or doctor or reports, gate labs, everything else, but I also videotape, I've videotaped every person since 1990. So if you came in my door in 1991, I could pull you up on my, I have it now on hard drives. So I could pull in and I could compare, but I didn't turn into a very good orthotist until I started studying gait, frame by frame, forward and backwards. 1,800 frames per, per minute. It's a lot of data. Triplanar management is probably the most profound thing that we have to do as orthotists in the future. Basically, most bracing is in a single plane. And really, we're three-dimensional. We have to be solved in three dimensions. That's why you have some knees caving in or knees going back and all that stuff. And, and, and the thing about knees going back, we have not, uh, you know, we, we keep developing solutions. What I'm taught, solutions in the back of the knee, where really it's an anterior or front knee buckling issue. So people will make a compensatory pattern to go backwards, and after cycle, 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 that knee starts going backwards. And if you solve it from the front and prevent that knee buckling, then they're going to feel secure and be able to... Um, move on, but triplanar management, uh, that's, a, that's a whole week course uh, right there. But uh, I just wanna let you know that you have, it has to be solved by triplanar control or management. Okay, I also go from A to Z. I am planning how that person and what function they're gonna be using on it. So if it's just standing or walking, that's what I'm planning for. If it's somebody gonna be working or you know, whatever it might be, I have to also add those other elements into it and how am I gonna solve those unique issues? I have many people that come with pain. One of the things, there's a nice, great talk today on pain. But one of the best things I found is when I realign in all three planes and get somebody balanced and let gravity work with us, 
I relieve most of those pain centers from the ground up, and that's including neck, shoulders, back, spine, knees, ankles, and so forth. I don't know how many surgeries I have uh, prevented by proper alignment. The human body wants to be properly aligned. And if it's not, if it just caves in a little bit, we are fighting gravity at every moment. We're eliciting extra uh, uh, muscle, but we're also getting adverse forces on the way those joints are malaligned through, you know, in three dimensions. So the first thing I do on my imaginary board is I write efficiency. Everyone who comes in to see me, the main problem is the efficiency issue. To walk from point A to, to B, you need to be efficient. But all the things we have to solve to enable somebody to walk efficiently is, is tremendous. The list is, is endless. But the first thing we need to do is identify your security issues. If you feel insecure about taking a step or the ankle rolling, your knee buckling, whatever, you're not going to do it. So you're going to make compensatory patterns, which then affects the efficiency. The more we solve, then we start eliminating those compensatory patterns. Balance. It's got to be balanced and aligned in all three dimensions, all the way up the whole chain. So we can allow mobility. No one's going to move unless they feel secure and balanced and know that they're going to be safe to do so. <clears throat> posture. There's going to be a whole talk on posture, but posture, it goes along with that alignment. I just saw a lady in, uh, in San Diego, major scoliosis and all that, but I found out a lot of it was functional. And so when I align and I balance everybody out, I get the pelvis level, I go all the way up the whole, whole chain, and all of a sudden her majority of her scoliosis disappeared and she just about started to cry in my office. It was just about a week and a half ago. Overuse syndromes, that's a, one of the main things that when you're aligned and offer better support and allow for that functional return, then all of a sudden we're getting those muscles, we want those muscles to shut off. A muscle is supposed to work for a millisecond and no, mo no more through that gait cycle. It's supposed to be on but resting more than it's on. And most polio survivors and anybody needing a brace, those muscles are on almost the whole time. We're fighting gravity at every millisecond, even recruiting all extra muscles throughout the body. Pain centers. I don't know how many times where you realign, they go, oh, wow, you took care of my back pain, or you took care of my ankle pain, and, or knee pain, or whatever. And uh, that, the human body, the joint surfaces want to be aligned. When they're out of alignment, just like the front end line, uh, alignment of the car, you're going to wear out joints or, or components. <clears throat> so one of the main things I do for efficiency is harness gravity. And harness gravity is like a concept of, okay, do we fight gravity or do we work with gravity? And I found that once I learned how to harness gravity to be our friend, oh my God, life just got easier. People could stand and just relax. They could talk to somebody eye to eye. And those are things that we, you know, we were not taught in school. And range of motion is more important than strength. Because with range of motion, gravity will hold us up. You don't need a whole lot of muscle power if you're aligned properly and gravity working with us. So I, when I encourage people to go out, I want range of motion studies and muscle tests, but I really don't want anyone to be strengthened. I've heard too many people coming in with polio that they've been, uh, they got hurt or they got weaker after going to physical therapy for strengthening. Or it could be their trainer or whatever. So I'm a, a strong proponent of stretching, getting range of motion, and those muscles will work when, when we saw that when we, we start walking. Here's a, um, oops, it's working. <laughs> Alita came to me at 74 years old. I am actually going to lower this on this one. 74 years old, and that's what she came in with crutches. She had a whole bunch stashed everywhere. And one month, it was the first time that she's able to walk hands free at 74 years old. So since four years old, she was unable to walk freely. So this is now at the one year mark. As a little girl, she couldn't do that. And then now you're going to see her walking down a little bit of a hill. This is her now. So 
So I took care of two major pain centers, her left knee and her right ankle. Now she's still weak, but she's strengthened. <clears throat> so she could walk around the house for short periods of time and she can't go on for too long, but here's day one and here's a year and a half later. Now her son was a physical therapist. This is her. And she'll ride up to five miles to a store. <clears throat> I'm going to do a case study here real quick. Um, Carla was uh, 65 at the time, retired physical therapist, contracted polio as an infant. She uh, really had a knee instability of the right knee. And she came walking in, and I go, geez, what am I going to do for, for her? But she, I found out that she had a wall, seven minutes of walking. So when she went to a store, she was a true target chopper. She went in, she knew exactly where she's going to go, what she's going to get, and get out. But if the line was too long, she just turned around. Mary uh, treated her for 10 years and just saw a steady decline over those 10 years. No sound now. Let me go backwards here. No sound? Um, who are probably looking at these. Let me, let me go backwards here and go. I'm Carla Stromberger. I'm a retired physical therapist. I would like to address my comments to other orthotists who are probably looking at these incredible uh, dynamic bracing solutions, braces going, eh, you know, what's the difference? Well, the difference is phenomenal. I'm both a physical therapist and a person who had polio. And I was becoming weaker and weaker. In fact, that's why I am no longer a physical therapist is because I really couldn't manage to be up and down from the floor all day long working with young children. I was losing so much of my functional skills and I was able to walk for probably somewhere between five and eight minutes, five and ten minutes without pain in my glutes which former orthotists said there was nothing we could do about. And um, I was able to stand for maximum 20, maybe 30 minutes without being desperate to sit down. I realized that I needed to go to a KAFO and wanted to find something that really helped me walk rather than possibly causing me to um, lose even more strength. As a physical therapist, I really think that those of you out there who are questioning this whole thing should really listen carefully because and pay attention to what patients can do in these that they have not been able to do in traditional with traditional bracing. Previously I was in an AFO for a while after an injury and I was in a knee orthosis for a while, um, none of which satisfactorily stabilized my, my joints and none of them gave me the energy to go ahead and move. I was continuing to decline. And the biggest issue, I think, was my glutes, my lateral glutes, actually. And now it turns out it was posterior glutes as well, and I just hadn't realized that. We're just getting weaker and weaker. My adductors were getting weaker and weaker, and I didn't realize it because I was able to accommodate really well. But I think it's really important for you to pay attention to the fact that these have great potential for many, many of your patients because they, allow, they give them the energy to move in normal movement patterns not the abnormal movement pattern that, a, that an AFO or a KAFO, a, a traditional one, offers. And I now am walking daily 
almost a mile on my hill with my braces on. I can't wait to go out and walk. I'm able to do so many more things that I didn't even know I wasn't doing until I um, got the braces. You can't believe how much has changed. So the braces are giving me energy by the dynamic design of them so that I can move ahead and be so much more functional than I've been in many years. They allow the muscles to rest and to fire because the alignment of the muscles and joints and all of that is so carefully built into the brace through the casting process and through the measuring process that it allows um, the person then to be in a good really good functional position for walking and then you take the dynamic part of it which allows the patient to almost be propelled by the brace and that alone um, is really important for long-term function. I had no idea that this was, that I was going to have this opportunity to um, walk, well as my physiatrist said, normally again in my life. Okay, here's, I'm going to go through this real quick, but this is our manual muscle test. So here in uh, December of 08, she had, this is the baseline. On the left hand side are muscle strength, down below are the muscle groups. Up on top you'll see that 08 and the BL is for baseline. So here, four months after fit, now that was four months before she was fit, the dark blue is four months uh, after she was fit and already gained muscle strength. Now this has been unheard of in polio survivors, but I've been noticing this since the 1990s. <clears throat> and then here's uh, a year later. So you notice that she's got muscle strength uh, improvement, and really what it is is we take care of the overuse syndrome. The other is by aligning in th all three dimensions, a weak muscle becomes stronger, or even a strong muscle becomes stronger with a better efficient line of pull. Now, one of the things that I noticed is her, her PT gave me a uh, uh, report. If you notice over there, her extensor got weaker. See the second, the dark blue? And right away, I called the physical therapist and, and uh, Carla up, and I said, you're not doing this patterning correctly because those muscles should not be overworking. And so then they went back, redefined their, their patterning, and uh, regained the muscle strength. Here's another very thing that's, uh, she showed a three year history of her, her uh, bone density getting worse. And on the fitting date, she was down to 75%, 100 is normal. So she was going from the osteopenia into the region of osteoporosis, headed that direction. And within one year, she, she gained more, that she's stronger, the bone density was uh, stronger than it was three years prior. And this is uh, a little uh, letter that uh, Dr. Benenacker, Carol Benenacker uh, wrote, since receiving DBS braces, uh, you can read that, but she basically has improved strength and balance and functional skills and so forth. So here's another case study, a physical therapist in uh, Arizona tried to prove us wrong. And he did a private little, a very clever little study, but he did uh, manual muscle testing, he did breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, respirations, uh, endurance, uh, breathing exercises, and so forth. Uh, his name is uh, David Guy. So here's a retired PMNR, that's a, a rehab physician, diagnosed with polio at 17. Basically when I, when we saw him, he was in a wheelchair only, doing tra uh, trans stand up and transfer only. It did, this was just giving uh, how the testing was done by, by him. He, he made sure everybody was rested. But here on uh, the BP is blood pressure. So the start and finish is his first session, okay? And you'll notice that the heart rate was when he first did the first 50 foot walk. So he started with 68 and it was 72 and so forth, okay? Everything got worse. 
his timed 50-foot walk was almost a minute. And then he would, you know, basically an average of 0.5 miles per hour. At the end of the 21st session, so it was seven weeks, uh, oh, as I elbow touches, at the, at the bottom was able to do 50 feet in 22 seconds versus one minute. Miles per hour was almost three times. So on this, uh, this is EMG, that's where they, they put the electrical, uh, uh, this is surface mount, so it wasn't needle stick or whatever. But if you look on the right hand side, these muscles improved in intensity or power, 50%, uh, 66, 83, 9%, 27, all the way down, but with an average change of 46%. That's pretty substantial. So here's uh, the session each week, how far uh, his endurance, uh, how far he is able to increase his uh, walking. So in seven weeks, he's able to get up to almost 2,000 feet. These are the before and after muscles. So when they started, week one, the initial zero over five, that means that you, there's no sign of any muscle power whatsoever. And they say in the literature that it's impossible to wake up a zero over five muscle. Uh, this gentleman who did the study, has, he's well published, uh, was a, uh, a, a PT instructor at Vanderbilt. And he, he just was just blown out of the water on how these muscles, weak muscles from polio, post polio syndrome, that have a history of going, getting weaker, come back and get stronger. And it's by those three things that I said, take it, getting rid of the overuse syndrome, realigning, giving better support, and then offering uh, new efficient biomechanics. So all the things showed improvement. Uh, here's a, another. I'm a physician and have, I had polio a long time ago and have worn a long leg brace and organ orthotic for probably, this is my second one, but probably about 15 years now. And after sending you a tape, you said, okay, I think I can do it and put you in a short leg -like brace and I didn't believe you. I come to San Diego for my three day training session and immediately am totally blown away by this whole thing. I mean, it, Honest to goodness, it's working. It's honestly working. This, 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 look. Aim training. This, for this. This. <laughs> this. And it's going to work. And I can't believe it's going to work. Well, I actually, now I do believe that it's going to work. I didn't get it at first. There is this little piece of carbon and, I don't know, plastic and foamy stuff and it holds me better than that long thing does even though it's just below my knee and uh, it's overwhelming it's overwhelming and then the more I leaned, in, leaned into it the safer I felt and so it's uh, amazingly solid and it's amazingly uh, it's reassuring that when I started doing the exercises and the movements and stuff, that when I did them correctly, and that's, you know, that it, it feels right, it feels safe, it feels secure, and, and on some sort of gut level. The bottom line is, um, it's a remarkable Thing. It's a remarkable thing. You've done good work. It's amazing that nobody's figured this out before now. This, I mean, the principles are very simple. When you explain to me the principles, the plumb lines and all this other stuff, and how you walk and how you don't walk, I mean, how people without disabilities walk, I know that the basics are, are very simple, but it's also to get from um, a skinny leg like this to a functional leg. There's a whole lot of thinking going on. One of the things I'm amazed at is that this skinny leg here that kind of juts off at this angle when I'm just standing up or even in my old brace, I mean, I don't know what it is. 
20 degrees, 30 degrees, some degrees off to the side from my knee. And I put this on and it straightens up. And it don't feel like there's, it's being twisted, but it, it, I, I straighten up. My leg straightens up. Um, and because of that, it sort of helps distribute the, I don't know, the weight, the balance, the something. Anyway, it's, it's amazing how much it corrects pathology. It, it corrected the pathology so that it, uh, I was uh, starting the movement, starting movement from a more normalized, biomechanically sound uh, position uh, at the base with my feet and then and then thus up the chain. Um, I think I think it's being able to examine the biomechanics of it and understanding exactly how all those bones work together. <laughs> and uh, and how, what, what a gait is, is much more than heel strike and, you know, all this other sort of stuff, looking all the way up the body and being able to analyze that is, is the piece that makes this especially extraordinary. I, I, when I, when kids ask me about why do I wear this, it's, and I say it's my exoskeleton, you know, it's sort of like an insect, uh, has the exoskeleton for security, and that's what this is. That's what that one was. This one is it's like it adds muscles it adds uh, it facilitates movement by the fact that you it wiggles a little bit I mean, I can't okay so to, to finish up here many people have uh, got the muscles where they have uh, become stronger the reduction of fatigue and falls, reduction of overuse syndromes, stand in, they could usually stand and walk further, reduction of pain, increased functional activities, a reduction of assistive devices. I'm more concerned about people's arms than I am about their legs, but to solve, get the weight off the arms, there's a great talk, Dr. Maynard talked a whole lot about the arms, but a lot of it is because there's too much weight on the arms. The arms are never meant to bear weight. And so to take all that pressure off, you need to solve the balance issues from down below. And so when you do that, all of a sudden, a lot of that weight can be, can be taken off. A lot of those pain centers will be uh, going away. I don't know how many surgeries can be uh, truly prevented and so forth. So um, there is so much more to this. There's just a little uh, thing. The three ways muscles are getting stronger are stopping overuse syndromes. That triplanar alignment allows muscles to work more efficiently and stronger. And then by the efficient biomechanical patterning. So what many polio survivors have never had is walk with a normal gait appearance. But when you reintroduce a more natural gait with the wiggle, all of a sudden muscles that were never asked to turn on will wake up. And those are from disuse atrophy. So we have three ways that muscles are getting, getting stronger. So thank you very much. Are we going to do questions now or when? Uh, no, we're going to do questions okay. together again. Okay. Do you need this? Well, hello. Uh, my name is Dennis Richards. Um, I'm. I'm from St. Louis and a local certified orthotist. Um, I've been in orthotics for since 2005 and started my career in 95 as a PTA, so I was in rehab doing physical therapy. And um, much like uh, Marmaduke, I saw a lot of brace designs out there and wanted to really just align myself and, and be part of a, a newer revolution with the new technologies that were coming down the pipeline. And, um, uh, fit a number of KFOs with, you know, my first experience in rehab with uh, polio patients were, were KFOs, metal, leather, those type, and uh, those seemed to, they worked well for the majority of the patients, and um, my, my thought initially was to, you know, hey, let's bring some of this new technology and, and serve these patients a little better, but, 
you know, to my surprise, and you know, they they weren't well accepted um, for a number of the patients, and um, many of them had reverted back to their previous metal and leather KFOs, and to me, uh, early on, it it was it was challenging, and um, but then I could I had to learn to understand that, that you know these devices had been around and they've been using them for a number of years, so. At this point in my career, I, when, when, I, when I have a polio patient come in to see me, um, you know, I, 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 take the, I take a different approach and uh, I don't try to convince anybody to change over to new technology. I just ask them, hey, I, I present it to them as, hey, this is something new for you. If it's something that you think and your physician think would you benefit from, then you, you know, you're at the right place. And uh, that's kind of what I'm here today to talk about, to show everybody some new technology. and. Um, uh, I'd just like to I'll start with uh, this KFO here. This is a uh, this isn't dynamic by any means. It's it's different than what Marmaduke was presenting here. This is a carbon graphite prepreg KFO. So it's very rigid. So it's uh, you, you know it's it's got durability um, by all means. Um, it's it's lightweight, but it's still got some uh, weight to it. It has. Um, uh, metal joints here in the ankle and the knee. Um, these can also be either stainless or titanium, uh, but it's it's very adjustable. And it, and it, the and this is a, I wanted to bring this today. This is an older brace, but it was it was a polio brace, and somebody actually had used this brace. And um, it has a locking feature at the top, so that you can release this with one hand, just a twist release, versus a double uh, drop lock design. And it also, um, you can see the posterior band here, that helps with the recurvatum and the knee hyperextension. Um, this is, uh, this was a, this is the, the style that I would typically see, uh, where you have a posterior uh, control of the knee here and uh, the release mechanism at the top. And um, also in the, uh, in the ankle section, you have these uh, ankle joints that are double adjustable so you can uh, actually fine tune the ankle position and um, you know work with the biomechanics of the patient and try to get the appropriate kinematics with the gait. This, um, this brace is also uh, has Velcro on the interior here that's removable so that you can clean if you need to. Um, but it, it does work. It's uh, one of the, you know, as a orthotist, I would see many patients and I would design my own or use other companies and this one's manufactured by Townsend Design which uh, I'm, I'm a representative for them and there's a reason for that I uh, out of all the designs that I tried whether they were metal or plastic or polypropylene this this brace is, is very durable and it's it's very this is the type of brace that uh, you can use it it's, it can it can handle the everyday wear and tear and um, so if you, if you guys have some time or you have any questions about this particular brace, um, feel free to contact me. I have um, in the um, book there, and I'll leave my card or I'll be around later on. You can uh, ask questions if you need to. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, um, that's the KFO. And then you have the AFO section, which is similar to that, just a lower section. It's the pre pre carbon fiber design as well. Uh, it's got the double adjustable ankle joints on it. And this one here has a, both of these have a polypropylene uh, foot plate that's heat adjustable. So that, um, you know, you can, if there's any pressure areas, it's easy to relieve that. Um, but these are all custom made. So there, there's a mold taken of the limb and uh, these are made from the mold. And for me working here in St. Louis, I, I would see a patient and I would cast them with the mold. The mold would be then shipped to uh, California where Bakersfield's headquarters and they would fabricate it and ship it back. So turn around on these is a couple of weeks, uh, depending on the insurance approval, uh, may stretch out a little bit longer. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, uh, in another one, one, one more thing that you can actually take these braces and they can be attached to the outside of the shoe. So I've done that on many occasions where they've, they've, uh, the patient comes in, they, they really like their shoe and they like the brace attached to the outside of the shoe. They've been like, They've worn that for years, so these can be designed the same way with a, a, a caliper stirrup added to the a foot plate as well. But um, that's pretty much what I wanted to present today. Um, 
and I'll, I'll be again I'll be around if you have any any, any questions anything you want to know about this uh, new technology I'll be happy to uh, answer that thank you well thank you I'm I'm really glad we have plenty of time for questions um, first just kind of um, reactions uh, again I said I'd be devil's advocate a little bit um, I, uh, I like to kind of give the 30,000 foot view um, it's important you know you have two excellent orthotists here um, who, who know how to fabricate, know how to evaluate, know how to think about bracing. And, and so for, from part of my advice for you all is, is to critically think not only about what your needs are, but be sure you have someone who, who you really have a lot of trust in that you could talk with that's listening to you and as these gentlemen can think through the process with you. And, and, and that's like, like, I mean, there are physicians out there who, who I'm embarrassed to say I'm in the same field with. I mean, I, that, that's true. It's true with any field. And, and it's certainly true with orthotists. And, 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 and if you've had bracing problems in the past, it, it might not be even the design of the brace. It might be the, the, the ability of the orthotist. Um, and maybe that design needs a little bit of tweaking or maybe it needs to be fit better because after all, if it hurts or it's causing ulcers and you can't use it, it's worth nothing. So uh, that would be point number one that I'd like to, to mention. Um, point number two is that, that um, both all these designs that you've seen so far um, are, are on the higher end, and we talked about cost as being a factor, and they're on the higher end of the cost factor. And that might be fine because that might be what you need. But I would like you to think about those issues that, that more expensive is not necessarily better. And in fact, it might not be what you want. And if you think about buying a vehicle, uh, and you have some need to, to be on some rough terrain, maybe you need a Humvee. I mean, that might be true, and there are people who buy Humvees who really benefit from having a Humvee. But how many people buy Humvees that don't need a Humvee? Correct? You know, so think about it. If you need a Humvee, then that's great. You might just do fine with a Subaru with four-wheel drive. You know, or maybe you need an old pickup truck. I, I don't know. Think about what it is you need and why you need it, and then whether or not the expense justifies the means. Sometimes it does. I was just mentioning that the Townsend brace, I, I've got a patient uh, who has a, um, uh, a two Townsend braces. He has a spinal cord injury. Um, and, and it's uncommon, as we were talking about, for folks with uh, uh, complete or near complete spinal cord injuries to be ambulating late into life. Most of the time, it takes so much energy that, and it's so hard on the shoulders that, that, that the braces end up in the closet and they end up uh, using their wheelchair, just more practical for them. Uh, well, this gentleman was, was, I mean, he was just built in the uppers and he was very svelte, but he was a strong guy and uh, he was a, a car salesman. Um, and, and he would, uh, he wanted to be able not to be in a chair, he wanted to walk up and down over his cars you know, with his clients, and, um, and that's what he did. But he was breaking his braces. I mean, I'm talking about in a matter of weeks, stainless steel, snap. And, and so, I mean, and, and I haven't seen them broken other than this fellow, but he, he's broke, even broken a Townsend brace, but that is really hard and it is well worth. And we had to go through hoops to get his insurance to pay for it and to justify it. But in the end, the insurance company actually made out because he, he wasn't getting new braces as frequently. So, you know, he needed that level and, and, and by all means. But I have plenty of people who have more conventional KFOs. They're working fine for them and that's what they need. Um, just as, for example, some of the dynamic braces, the woman who went from the KFO to the floor reaction brace. Um, and there are, I've had plenty of folks who've gone from conventional KFOs to using custom fit plastic or hybrid uh, uh, um, AFOs that are floor reaction that also support the knee and, and, and they do great. So there are times where our dynamic component may be helpful. There's other times where you get the majority of the benefit at a much lower cost locally to where you're at. So I just want you to think through, again, what your needs are and be aware of the time, effort, money that you're spending in evaluating these. But don't give up. Don't, don't just you know, throw in the towel and say, well, I don't have somebody who can take care of that. Seek out, talk to therapists about your local orthotist and find somebody who does well. Maybe there's somebody in you know, a couple of towns over somewhere else. But keep looking. And, uh, and, and certainly there are more innovative designs that, that tend to be much more expensive, but, but certainly for some people 
uh, uh, meet their needs in a way that, uh, that other bracing will not. So there isn't no one size fits all, literally and figuratively, that there's a lot of different designs, there's a lot of different ways of approaching things, and, uh, and be a critical thinker, again, is my message. So in terms of question answers, um, I, obviously we don't have a table up here big enough for all of us. I'm thinking, why don't we just bring these mics down here, and then we can go around and answer questions. Does that sound good? <coughs> I'll hold on to this one here so I can <laughs> see who's. Uh, I think there was a question. Somebody right here, you had your hand up first. Okay, I had a brace until I was five, one of the old leather ones. I fixed it because I was going to have to wear it for the rest of my Well, I, I, I'll, I'll give my quick answer, and then if you guys could both. Um, it, it all depends upon the needs and the componentry and, and whether you're talking about a different type of AFO versus KFO. So there's going to be a big range. Um, secondly, but I, I want to address, th they're going to get your cost question, but when you said earlier about the leather brace, um, there are folks who've had the leather brace, and they want the leather brace, and they're happy with the leather brace, and I learned early on in my residency that there were times that I really persuaded folks to try this new brace, and guess what? They were not happy. And I learned that when it's working and they want it, you listen and you stick with it. So now yours is different because you stopped using it, now you're thinking you might need something else, it sounds like. But just to throw out there, sometimes the old stuff is what they want and works for them. So um, we'll get to you right after, but if you guys want to answer that question about cost. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming you're speaking to more of a AFO lower leg brace, or do you remember? Well, those the so the AFO. Uh, yeah, this one ballpark would be um, with everything you see here, probably about uh, fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, but that would be on the higher end for an AFO, and it depends on the region you live in as well. The, the fees change, but yeah, that would probably be a close ballpark. Would, how and, would you and think? for the KFO? Yeah, the KFO. This one you're looking at probably, I would say with the same setup here, probably around 3,500, 3,200, somewhere in there. And then of course insurance issues are, uh, you know, that's the, the, the who knows, you know, what, what's going to cover. So Marmaduke, and I'm sure you have a big range in terms of your. Yes, racing. I do. <laughs> what, one thing is, what I found out is with the complexities of most polio survivors, is that the amount of detail and time it really takes to solve your unique issues is time and knowledge and high, higher tech. And so I could make a prosthesis, say a below the knee prosthesis that would be similar to say an AFO, and it takes me five times more time and effort and skill to develop, believe it or not, deliver one of these. And but yet my costs are less than that prosthesis. So on, a, on an AFO, they start about 5,500, and they could go up. The most expensive K, uh, AFO I've ever done was 25,000. But guess what? The one I did for 25,000 and the other one for 24,000 last year, both are praising the gods that we got them up off the couch and moving. These are not polio survivors. Uh, very, very, very complex uh, issues. But the gentleman that, that pay, uh, paid 25000 for that AFO had already, they've gone over a million and a half in surgeries and healthcare and hospitalizations, and he was still in pain on the couch. For 25000 he is now up and running. So balance out the cost there and tell me what, you know, what, what's expensive or not. So when you, the cheapest healthcare is when you do it right the first time. And if you solve those complex issues, enable efficient standing, anything that you could stand up, any brace that you could take in your hands and twist and torque will not be something you're going to be able to learn to, to trust. 
A prosthesis, you can't do that. They could trust it because it is a firm device where they put their weight on it and the energy, it's there for them. So the, the cheap plastics that we were taught all our, our years, anything you move or twist will torque and will learn to actually stay away from it. And then it becomes nothing more than an outrigger. Efficiency is when you could, even on a limb that you've never put weight on, learn to trust and put weight on it and fully control you all the way through the gait cycle. That's, you know, so, so you're going to trade dollars and value. And when you get the pelvis moving back and forth to have a more natural gait appearance, that looks a whole lot better. Everybody just usually feels a whole lot better. But is it, is everyone successful? No. And you need to know that. Is it a challenge to go with my systems? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, one, one point I will make, and, and, and it's also important to know when you're talking to anyone uh, about where they're coming from, who they see, what their perspective is. Um, for example, Dr. Bach, I was making uh, the, the, the point, I made a comment, he sees folks with severe neuromuscular problems and breathing problems. Some of his statements might not apply to somebody who has no respiratory weakness. Um, and so it's important to know that about him. And I, I've got more respect for Dr. Bach than him. He's just amazing. So I would make one comment, though, about the flexibility, uh, about braces that have flexibility to them, and, and say that you know, some folks who have very mild weakness, who aren't complicated, who don't need to seek out someone, uh, um, and their, their needs have been met, there are certainly folks who have uh, what we call a modified AFO that's made in plastic, it's fairly inexpensive, and, and simply gives them a little dorsiflexion, and, and there are times I've taken a look at the brace off of the patient when I come in the room and say, I'm not quite sure about this, but they're completely happy, and I see them walk with them, and it meets their needs. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue necessarily that anyone with a plastic brace that that's inappropriate because there's certainly a lot of people who objectively look fine and it's comfortable and it meets their needs. So again, th that might be somebody who's fine with a pickup truck. So I'm sorry, you had a comment, I think, about this? Question. Yeah. Comment and a question. How long do you think dynamic braking has been, you know, uh, uh, since the uh, 19, well, ever since the 84, I've been working this way. Uh, we got into the dynamics probably in the um, early to mid 90s. And is there, like, and, and I'm training orthotists around the country. Well, it, it, if the weakness is enough, I like pairing it. It's just like uh, trying to put two different wings on an airplane. You know, you want to balance and get everything to work together, and you get the same, uh, you know, the same patterning in a sense. Uh, there are some people that just need a little this, and the answer would be yes, a, 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 a toe pickup. I have never seen the same two feet or knees or legs or whatever, so to come in and give you something to give you some idea would be very tough. I make everything as ultra custom. There is a learning curve. If you've walked with compensatory gait pattern for 54 years, it is hard to now learn how to walk with a more natural, more efficient gait. It takes pattern, patterning and practice. So if you're a type of person that will not Want, you know, they just want to strap on the miracle. Probably not the best uh, device for us to, to start with. Your point, though, I think is, is a really good one in terms of how you're thinking that through. And, and, and my, my analogy breaks down with regard to that because the point is, no, you, you can't take a test drive. You, know, you can't take the vehicle out and say, I like it or I don't. That would be nice. And um, there's also the other thing to keep in mind is we only have uh, two, you know, two 
uh, orthotists here talking, but there's a lot of other, you know, options out there in terms of, of looking at uh, stance control bracing and things like that, so, you know, w uh, with, with computerized componentry and all sorts of new stuff, and that can also be very expensive. And uh, I, I've had experiences with patients on both ends. I've, I've had times where they've gone through a lot of work and they weren't quite happy with it. And I've had some that just been, you know, my God, they're, they're the increase in function, they were just happy as a clam. So anyway, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm saying your, your point of how you're working through that, I, I appreciate. There's a question back there, I think. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's a, uh, a, uh, a woman I said about a week and a half ago that I saw. She had a functional scoliosis because no one ever balanced her off. And what I will do is I'll balance her off. She had like a two and a quarter inch uh, difference. And so what I do is I put that in a shoe. I, could, I usually put it, believe it or not, up to three inches uh, within a shoe. And what I do is I do it under a heel. I use satch heels. I use the same principles we use in prosthetics. And you've seen amputees run and walk and do all that stuff. It's because the, it, what works for them works for bracing. And so, yeah, or they could be very compromised because of how short the amputation is. And yes, they're two different animals, but the mechanics. Humans are humans. We, we, they, we, we follow the same laws of physics. And so they need, you, know, you need to solve them that way. When, like uh, orthotics, we are learned to cut the brace off at the bed heads. Yet prosthetics, we'd never think about doing that. But to solve somebody who has anterior knee control or the front knee control from buckling, we need a full length foot plate on that. It needs to be firm. Yeah. And it needs to allow a forward progression. That's why these are angled. And these are designed by the geometry of the person to allow full control over the front dynamic response and then lift off. That, that's a really good point with regard to knee control. If you're looking at a, a floor reaction brace, which, which means a, you know, an AFO that's helping to control the knee from buckling. And so if, if you um, have tried one in the past and it, and it didn't work. Oh, by the way, uh, another point. If you're seeing a physiatrist or you're seeing an orthotist locally or physical therapist and you haven't been happening with your bracing in the past or it's worked in the past but you've gotten weaker, um, bring in your braces. Bring in your shoes. Let them know, I like this about this one. I don't like this about this one. And that prevents making the same mistake twice. But there's been plenty of times that I've seen in our area, we, we have an orthotist I work with regularly. I do a brace clinic in my office, and they do stellar work. They do not stop until it fits well and it functions well. There's another company that sometimes it works well the first time, but if it doesn't, I, I just haven't been happy with the follow through. And so there's, there's folks that I'll see in the community who will bring in these braces and they have a floor reaction AFO, but it doesn't have a rigid foot plate, and it, or it's short. And so it's, it's like, you know, what are you doing? This doesn't make any sense. And, 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 and then you, you, you redo the, the same concept, also in plastic, but it works fine because it's done correctly, both from the technical standpoint and the follow through. There's plenty of times we see folks and we try something and it doesn't quite work and we either have to modify it or to get it to fit better or, you know, and then sometimes, you know, I, we don't do this often, but we say, you know what? I ain't gonna work. Let's regroup. So, please. My ambulance where her things were on the day she had, had the rigid foot plate. Well, for two years, I didn't wear my foot plate very often at all. Because her rigid foot plate, I wear it an hour or two hours, and my, would have so much pain in my foot, and my toes would go down. I couldn't figure out what it was, and it turned out I had no fat pads, and the rope was on the ball of my foot. And with the Good. Rigid foot plate, yeah. I could not tolerate that full foot. And, and, and so, did, they have, did they have a metatarsal pad on it? Okay, a metatarsal pad is, is um, and, and here's, again, 
These are things where we have to be very careful, by the way, that I'm not going to be able to fix everybody's specific issues standing up here with a microphone. We know that. So what I'm going to do is I want to be very careful about this, is if somebody brings up a specific issue they have, I want to use that as an opportunity to say, oh, you know, that type of issue, sometimes we do this. I'm not saying this was either worked for you or didn't, but, but oftentimes when people have discomfort from a rigid foot plate, if you put a metatarsal pad, the metatarsal would be the, the ball of the foot, okay? And you put a pad, but it's got to be it's got to be done exactly right. It can't be on them. It can't be too far back. It needs to be able to to, to be to able to push on the metatarsal heads appropriately. It can't be too thick. It can't be too wide. And it's quite a bit of of, of trial and error. But uh, other comments about that? In in uh, the hundreds and hundreds of these that I've done with Richard foot plates, if it is if the whole limb is balanced in all three dimensions over that foot then your weight distribution on the whole foot is reestablished, not just where you're leaning on one side or the other. The other is that I will put and distribute pressure on the whole foot, not only on the metatarsal heads and the heel as we normally do. So I'll, I'll, I will load up the whole foot so it's equally distributed so, uh, so for comfort. But if we need to, we'll put a liner on the bottom. Did you have any other points about that? No, it would, yeah, just it would. I'd have to see the foot plate to really see what material exactly. So, yeah. without seeing, I don't really know. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I think the point that was good about uh, to, uh, more total contact as well, and and um, although I, I I did mention the the metatarsal pad, you also want to make sure that there's enough arch support and that the brace is fitting well so that you have that total contact. Sometimes you can take off a brace and look from across the room and you can see that just doesn't fit. No wonder it's not comfortable uh, because it just wasn't, you don't have that contact. There's just too much room. Yes, sir. Obviously, that's the best answer. <laughs> Au contraire. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, how does the system work together? So do you go to the orthotist or the physical therapist? I think it. So I, I think it's a really good question. A really good question, and I like process questions. And by the way, I think that process questions like that are going to be more valuable for everybody than than the specific information. Um, I, I can tell you what we do, and, and that is you kind of get the best of, of both worlds. I, I have the orthotist in the office with me, and so we we see the patient together before I write the prescription. And um, and we've gotten to the point where we tend to think alike, and we can kind of complete each other's sentences, but we love to show the other person up. So <laughs> he, I'll say something and he'll say, I don't think that's going to work because of this or vice versa. And so the, the quality of care goes up because we're just challenging each other and the patient is there and the family is there and we got all the braces there. And so we, we really try to drill down before the scripture, prescription is written and say, what are some possible solutions? And by the way, the other uh, part of that dynamic in terms of the prescription is, what are your goals? I mean, we're talking about people as if the, the person is static, but, but that's not true. When I first came out of residency, um, I, I was telling this earlier, the first brace clinic I did, uh, I, I, I remember this coming out of residency, I kind of, you know, was indignant that people were coming with these braces that were all beat up and dirty, you know, and then there are other people coming and the brace was nice and shiny and clean. <laughs> and it, it did take me long to realize that these folks weren't wearing them, you know. <laughs> And so I like dirty braces that are worn and beat up, and I'm like, great, you know? And, and so, um, you know, my, my point is, is, is though, that, that we have to think about the person, how they want to use a brace. And, and another point with regard to that that I'm going to throw out is that when you do it in a, in a group like that, and you have not only the patient but their family, and you're in a brainstorming session, you're really thinking together, then you come up with some other answers. Um, for example, more than one type of brace or I'm not going to wear a brace during these situations, but these situations I will. 
Um, we have Western Pennsylvania. Uh, there's lots. Of, I, I do a, a, a CMT clinic. Uh, these people with uh, progressive neuropathy or hereditary neuropathy, and, and a lot of times they, quite frankly, they, 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 from the psychological standpoint, their parents has braces. They just, they don't, they, they just stress over the whole idea of bracing. So I said, look, if that's, if it doesn't meet your needs, you don't need it, you don't want it, that's fine. Let me just show you these are the options. And then, especially the, the, the guys who are into uh, deer hunting in Western Pennsylvania, that, that's a biggie. I'll just kind of soft pitch it and say, you know, if you want, you know, if you, I know you're not hunting anymore. I mean, if you'd like to hunt, maybe we could look at a brace that would help stabilize you so you're comfortable going in the woods again. Like, you can do that. I said, well, that, that, that would be a reasonable goal to work on. And now they have something functional that they're going to achieve that they weren't able to do before. And or their spouse would say, yeah, you know, that kind of makes sense. And so they start using it part time and, 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 and then they find other uses that they, they and, that, and, and now you have them walking with a more normal gait. But you can't, you know, uh, th those convinced against their will are of the same opinion still. You know, when I, when I see somebody and, and I know that they could be walking better with this type of brace because I've seen them walk and I know what this brace will do, it does absolutely no good if when they leave the office, they're not convinced that that helps them in their life. And, and so that's a big part of it. And I think that's an extension of, of your question in terms of how to access. Um, so please. I'd like to add a little something to that too. Um, and I'm not a physiatrist. I'm a family physician <laughs> who prescribes braces. Uh, but I've done a lot of on-the-job training. One of the problems I see in the medical community is that there's no specialty other than PM&R anymore that owns bracing. The orthopedists that we used to see as kids and that prescribe my braces, um, they get one hour lecture on orthotics, on braces, and one hour lecture, maybe, on prosthetics in their residency, period. Um, so, and like in Denver, in Denver, none of the physiatrists, we don't have any general physiatrists other than at the university, but they're all at Craig with spinal cord injury and head injury, or they're doing pain management. It's very, frequently, it's very hard to find a physiatrist. So, it, it, but it really depends on how somebody gets there. Um, and I, I'm probably the only family doctor in the United States that prescribes braces, but. Please. Well, first of all, sometimes, I mean, you have to you network a little bit, and, and there are times, we would, in our post-polio clinic, we would get folks driving um, some pretty considerable distances, uh, both within Pennsylvania, from Ohio, West Virginia, and such, and, uh, you know, we have, our orthotist does a great job, but you have to consider not only getting there, you have to say, well, what if it's not working in the future, or having any kind of difficulty, and access, and things like that, so, we, we're, we're glad to see somebody drive in six hours who wants to come back and do the braces and sometimes they have a local connection, their kids live nearby and so it's kind of an excuse to come. But, but, but we ask them to really, you know, really search locally because sometimes you find stuff that you don't know. And so be, be going around asking physical therapists and physicians about, you know, who they'd recommend and things and, 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 and so there, there might be somebody who's local that you don't realize. One of the resources potentially also is um, the American Board for Certification, abcop.org. If you put in your state, the zip code, your area, they will, and put in a parameter like within 50 miles, they'll let you know who are certified um, practitioners. I had someone from Eastern Colorado who called me and wanted to know, and I didn't know you know, it was like, well, Greeley, but that's three hours, Denver's four hours. Put in Holyoke, Colorado, and I got, there was a CPO in Bankelman, Nebraska, 35 miles away. <laughs> there you go. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Way in the back.
uh, correct. Although um, one of the points that uh, I was making earlier with pain and, and bracing is um, that when, when you stabilize distally um, and, and allow motion that helps you to have a normal gait cycle, but also support and keep the proper alignments, which you heard Marmaduke talk about, then you, um, you, you, you allow the body to function more normally. And so some of the hip uh, pain issues and weakness issues over time go away be because you've taken care of that. So as an example, uh, if anybody was at the pain program, I was talking about the sacroiliac problem. And, and so if you have a sacroiliac problem you know, in your low back, you can have that by simply having weakness of your dorsiflexors, your ability to pull up the, the, your toes. And that's not a sophisticated bracing issue. But without it, you end up pulling your leg up in order to clear or bringing your, your leg out in order to not trip on it. Now I know that's a very simple example, but the fact is that if you don't take care of the more distal problem, you're gonna have the more proximal problem. So even though the AFO or the, the KFO or the floor reaction bracing that you saw don't come up to the hip, they can still help fix hip problems. Gotcha. And, and there, are, there are hip bracing solutions, and that is a, a more unusual problem. It's kind of hard to generalize a, a statement on that, but it is, you're, you're absolutely right. That is a, a more difficult um, scenario, especially since, and, and I'd like if you guys have specific answers to these, um, especially since when, when we have a brace that does, look, again, I'm going to generalize rather than just use your one specific issue so everybody can kind of learn. Um, let's say you did have more distal weakness um, and, you, and a brace from the floor up would help stabilize you. When you put your foot on the ground, you have that stability to work off of. Without it, um, it limits the capacity of, of the brace. So for example, knee braces themselves, a custom knee brace, does not do nearly as well even if it's just a problem with knee stability as, as one that goes off of the ground because it's attaching to soft tissues and those soft tissues will move, okay? And, and depending upon somebody's girth and the size of their leg, just bracing across the hip would be fraught with difficulty because there'd be a lot of motion and movement. So that's why that would be a very difficult issue to address just from the bracing standpoint. Do you guys have other thoughts on that? You know, I think um, maybe, uh, I don't know if you've seen a, a physical therapist to have a manual muscle test and range of motion testing. Yeah, I, I mean, that would be the first recommendation to really get to pinpoint exactly where the weaknesses are. And, um, and they, you know, but since you've been through that, maybe, maybe looking at uh, seeing a, your, your physician and talking to an orthotist about a possible hip uh, extension or a, a different type of brace. Yeah, and I was trying to answer the question just from the, the bracing standpoint, but, but I, I think that the point is well taken. I, I kind of presumed you had strengthening, but, but to broaden that question more, it is appropriate to be thinking about, well, maybe bracing isn't my answer. And so sometimes, even though, for example, someone can walk without an assistive device, um, I'll give you a suggestion that I often give folks who have spinal stenosis, okay? And they might have some weakness and pain from spinal stenosis. And then they, they start walking less, and, and I, I, use, I always oftentimes talk about bracing in terms of, of a person's world kind of contracting. They, they over time do a little less, they get weaker, they do a little less, they get weaker, and their world gets smaller and smaller. From my standpoint as a physician, if any type of bracing helps them to increase the world and do more, then we're on the right track at reversing that, okay? And the same is true with non-bracing solutions. So for example, somebody with spinal stenosis, when they go into extension, they have a lot of pain, they can only stand for so long, and, um, and so they start walking less, they get weaker, that leads to more pain, they get the cycle going. A, a lot of times using something like a rollator walker, a walker with a seat, so that they can stand up straighter, not functionally, not just to get around the house, but for exercise. 
I say take it outside, take it to the park, start walking around the block and then two blocks and then three blocks, and then as they're getting stronger, they've got the, tr the core strength more, the, and, and, and they, they walk right out of the problem, they don't need the, the walker anymore. So sometimes, I guess my point is, sometimes the answer is, you know, a cane, loft strand, crutch, uh, rollator walker, uh, physical therapy, non-bracing solutions are important to look at, and that, that might be the case, although I'm sure you've gone down a lot of those roads. Please, go ahead. I had a, a gentleman who had zero hip flexor. Uh, that I, it doesn't take a whole lot of hip flexor strength to actually walk, but the dynamics of, the, of a ground reaction. Uh, so just like a prosthesis that gives a dynamic response. And so all he had to do is learn to harness that dynamic response, just like an amputee learns how to harness dynamics of a prosthesis. And that will fire that foot and propel it forward. And this gentleman was wearing out Ferragamos every week. And he stopped going out. He stopped going out to dinner. He lived in uh, uh, La Jolla. And then after I showed him how to do it and walk, I mean, the family went, you know, hurrah type of thing. But next thing I know, he drove into my office by himself this time with a brand new Porsche Carrera. <laughs> and I'm like, and this guy's in his mid-70s, so I'm going, okay. <laughs> and he goes, well, now I could get out and I could be independent. And now I could walk anywhere and not be afraid. But so instead of dragging that leg, it just depends on how you use technology. Uh, but it does take courage and technique and, and patterning to, to do that. So it's not a simple just put it on and, and have it work. But it really doesn't take much hip flexors to walk. Well, uh, what I was showing you with all the strength, uh, uh, we do it all the time. Now, could I guarantee who gets stronger and who not, which muscles will? No. But if we cut out the overuse syndrome, align it better, and then also with, uh, with better patterning, the pelvis going back and forth how it should be, and we stop all the very taxing compensatory patterns, then uh, muscles from disuse atrophy can regain strength because they're, they're not being used. So uh, on her, she felt muscle power. She feels a spring. And most of, you know, as many of my wounded warriors that I fit, uh, right away they go, God, I feel when they're realigned, I feel muscles engaging. I feel things happening that I haven't felt before. And I, I got endless videos, uh, so I could show almost anything. But when you realign, uh, muscles will start feeling like they engage or, still, or, or start working. That's where I would, uh, and we'll get to you in a second. That, that's where um, in my, my thinking about your world restricting versus expanding it comes in. If, if any type of brace um, is, is helping to expand your world and do more and stay more active, it, it really undoes the, the myth that bracing makes you weaker, right? Now, yes, a restrictive brace that is not necessary um, you know, uh, theoretically could, could cause some weakness, but that's not what we're talking about. And, uh, and so has anybody heard that myth that, that bracing you will make you weaker? Okay. I, I really, I mean, I, I want to, as strongly as I can, d defeat that. If you are, are you looking at bracing that's appropriate and it increases your function and you're, you're walking further and doing more, uh, how's that making you weaker? I will actually add to that, though, since, uh, again, I'm looking for excuses to te teach little tidbits here. Um, and, uh, and this is more, I, I guess I've heard this more in my CMT population than polio, but, uh, but still, um, one thing that I think feeds into that myth is that you have someone who gets a brace and they're using their brace full time, and they're seeing benefits for it, and, and then they, it normalizes their gait, and, and then uh, let's say uh, just a, two or three weeks later, they have a day and they decide not to wear their brace. And then they trip on their foot. Well, 
they're trying to walk the way they were with the brace. Well, they couldn't do that. That's why they had it on the beginning, they, to begin with. They, they have kind of, there, there are some people who adapt very easily. I'd be curious if you guys have any thoughts about this, but, but it's been my observation that there are some people who adapt very easily into their brace and out of their brace, and they can, they can accommodate and change their gait style. And there, there's other people that, that, you know, we all have our talents, and there are some people that we can just say are kind of motor morons. They just don't, <laughs> they just don't adapt their body that way. And so when you take somebody who doesn't adapt their body quickly and they're used to walking with their brace and they have this really nice normalized gait and then you take their brace away, they feel unstable, they might trip on their foot, they're not accommodating the way they used to before. And so that can be a, a real problem and, and feed into this notion that it makes you weaker. So again, I, I look at things from the functional standpoint and I, I agree. I, I, I think that a good brace can ultimately make someone stronger and improve their endurance. And, Oh, please. Well, I, I break it down to segmental. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I break it down to uh, segmental training, and it's really uh, uh, well. Well, let's see if I could stand up and try to demonstrate. Um, one of the first things I try to do is everything from balance and movement comes from the pelvis. Okay, to stop this from moving, which is a tremendous amount of weight going back to 70% of your your body weight. To keep that still, we need to get back to where we move in the pelvis back and forth. And so the first thing I do is I'm having them go forward and back and go up on their heels, up on their toes to learn to balance. Balance is how far we can move the pelvis without moving all this. And so they got to go through that. And is it easy? No. But if they're not going to do it, then, you know, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're, they're, they have to practice. And you have to gain that, uh, learn to trust that device. I, I would like to see what they're doing, but occasionally I'll say I see that very rarely, but I'll say uh, this may an acute phase because all the motions are going to be within natural, okay, patterning. So the human body should be able to tolerate that. They just, if they've been doing this all their life, okay, to try to now bring the pelvis over, they have stretching to do. And that's where I'll say go see a PT who is a back specialist or stretch out or do whatever. And I find that range of motion alleviates a lot of that. But for the most part, pain, when they stand up, on how many people, oh, wow, well, you've done more for my back surgery than, uh, you know, the five surgeries I've had. And, you know, because the human body wants to be aligned, and it wants to move in the most natural patterning. So that's what I do. And then, uh, then I'm just trying to train to get that pelvis to go over that foot and then to keep, keep going over. But, uh, and I would think also that, uh, you know, as, as a physical therapist, obviously, you can have a much less complicated issue where, where there's an, an exercise that makes complete sense and the person's doing it, but, you know, not, not everybody does their exercises the same. And, and while there's some people who smile and nod, they're doing them, and when you really get to it, they're not. Uh, and then you have folks who are so intense about doing it. I'm, I've had folks who I've had them, you know, teaching them quad sets for knee arthritis, no neurologic problem at all, which generally can be really helpful by, I know you know this, but just for everybody, by, by strengthening the muscles that stabilize the knee. But, but rarely you see people who get worse and they're just, you know, out of the block. They've been doing nothing and now they're really intense and, and it flares their symptoms. So I, I think of exercise just like medications. You know, and, and the dosing needs to be appropriate, and some medications you kind of need to slowly get into it, and, and other times you can just start the, the full dose and they're fine. So I, I think there's probably a factor of that. You probably agree with that. Yeah. So. Uh, also, I'd be glad to, uh, you know, if you send me videotapes or whatever, I'd be glad to help you uh, work through some of those people. <clears throat> yes, please.
I, 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 I'm working on a microchip where you just take it out of the head and put it one in. So. <laughs> I like. I like. Virtual reality think. is, I think, uh, well, may help with the training in the future. Yeah. Uh, and I, I really like the way that you think, and I don't doubt that that's. And there's a, there, there's always kind of a lag time between technology and the and the practical application of that technology. Um, and uh, you know, we were having a, a discussion about uh, more remote areas, you know, uh, and, and some of the needs in places like Africa. And we've got, you know, this technology that, that is just unbelievable for being able to do telemedicine, but, but yet it's, it's not applied yet. It will be. I mean, there's just no question about it. And it's just a matter of you got to iron out the wrinkles and get the application and get people to, to use it. But no, I, I like the way you think, absolutely. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I've been in a full leg brace and uh, crutches all my life. And one leg, my right leg, is completely frail. And there's no muscle tone at all there. Um, I've talked to orthopedic doctors. I've been to the physical therapist. I've been to my brace specialist, whatever. And they never come up with an answer for me. When I wear my shoe out in public and wherever, I don't walk nearly as well. As soon as I get home, I take that left shoe off. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard one, I think, to, um, to kind of you know, answer. You need to do a full and, assessment on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I would, would think of, uh, though, if you haven't met with, and I understand that, that, uh, that, that many of you might not have, uh, you know, a brace clinic where you can get a physician and the orthos together, but, but most good orthotists would, if you say, hey, this hasn't been getting better, can you, can you meet me and the physical therapist or meet me at my physiatrist's office? Uh, most of them would jump at that chance, especially because just from the marketing standpoint, they'd like to get to know these folks. So, and, and then there's something about when you have more than two people that just opens your thinking to other options. Um, and I, I think it's a competition thing, at least it is for me. You know, I, I love to have people challenge me, and then I challenge them. And so you might try and see if you can establish that. And just because individuals haven't doesn't mean that a group not, might not be able to, to do some, some thinking out of the box. So that would be my suggestion. To, to go back with the question that you're saying with the physical therapy, uh, I had a person recently who had very uh, she had sciatica down both sides. Uh, it was back and forth, and one was worse than the other, and then the other one. And as she was going down the bars, get that pelvis back and forth. By the time she did a few runs of that, she goes, "Wow, my my back feels a whole lot better." Now it kept flaring up, <laughs> but she w she had a chronic back prior to, to to being seen, and so that's something where I, I'd say you need to go see your physical therapist, a back specialist, usually help through that. How are we doing, Tom? Good. Good. And the red? Is anything, has anybody mentioned back braces, the flexible support, lumbar facial forces to reduce the height? Anybody still Why? make it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, I mean, you definitely can uh, seek out an orthotist in your area, and they are available, absolutely. Custom corsets, um, they're still out there. Harder to find them. They're, they're, yeah. they're, Harder to find, where do you get them? Is there a manufacturer? I, I don't do those, I mean, I don't, but I in other areas there's manufacturers. Um, I'm not sure about this well, area. Well, perhaps getting on the website Go, and, yeah, and making some I phone calls. I know that they are. They're still out there. Yeah. It's also important to think about what, what the goals are. Um, and, uh, and, and so, um, uh, you know, uh, if, but, but for example, you know, custom braces are used um, in, in adolescence with, um, with progressive scoliosis. Um, that's still a, an application. Um, they're um, c c custom. Um, braces of that sort can be helpful for pain relief sometimes, 
but they have to balance that with the risk of getting weaker. Because unlike um, the, uh, the, the, the braces that we're talking about for the lower extremity, again, if it increases your world and you're doing more, if, if you have someone who is wearing a rigid brace of any sort and they're not actually doing more, then you, need to, you do need to be concerned about the person getting weaker and their ability to then support their trunk on their own. So there's, and we see this even for example, folks with no neurologic problem whatsoever. Um, if you've seen uh, folks with back injuries um, wearing those, uh, those, those, those black back supports, for example, there's a really nice design of those that has uh, Velcro straps that you pull off. And, and so it, it's kind of, and they have shoulder um, straps on them. So it's there, but it's not tight. And so it's not substituting for your own muscles. But then, no, this is more for, I'm, I'm using an example of somebody with a work injury, for example. And they're lifting and they hurt their back and you're trying to get it back to work. And, and so they can do most of their activities, but when they have something over 50 pounds, for example, they're really at risk for hurting their back. Well, before they pick that up, now they tighten it and they can use it. But you don't want to have that tight like that all the time because then it'll actually get weaker because you're substituting for muscles. So that, those are some of the factors you go into whenever you're talking about uh, splinting or, or bracing the, the trunk. Um, so, so again, the, what, you have to think about what your goals are and what the benefits are and whether or not it's making you more active or not. I, I had a woman from Northern California that came in with a, uh, a full um, spinal cervical collar and, and thoracic uh, extension and very hard to, she, had a, she had, was always laying down trying to uh, rest because it just took too much uh, energy for her to stand or walk by realigning her lower extremities, all of a sudden she was walking all around and I go, how come you never use that cervical collar anymore? And he goes, just the way you have me aligned, everything's stacked up. So I'm not fighting gravity so much. So it could be as simple as alignment issue uh, on that. There are polio survivors that have weak spine, spinal muscles where they may need the assistance of of that. So it just and again, looking at non-orthotic issues, you know, sometimes wheelchair design, seating design, the, the type of cushion you have and how stable it is. You know, for example, Rojo cushions are great for pressure relief, but they don't give you a lot of stability. Okay? And, and, and having a good stable cushion, the lateral supports, a custom back on a wheelchair can make all the difference without having to have a rigid brace can sometimes meet some of those goals. Again, it depends what the issue is we're, we're talking about, but to generalize the issue, those are some other things to, to think about. Other questions? Okay. Oh, well, we know. We guess we do. <laughs> Good question, Simon. But, but I'm just sort of thinking, what, what we're seeing here is this beautiful black brace. And one of the things that I heard Lan say was, you know, um, it would be great if uh, if things were in, the perfect brace would be invisible. And I'm just wondering. Um, I, I have seen some of these um, braces in various colours, which is Or, or skin color, or 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 the other issue is that sometimes people, right. sometimes people, um, it's kind of like I, I would use the analogy of canes. Uh, when people um, think of a cane, oftentimes they think of this old wooden cane that your grandmother would use. And and just kind of on the internet now, I, I have folks coming into my office with these canes. I'm like, I'd like one of those. That's really cool. I, that's a really neat pattern. It it becomes an accessory. Yeah, there you go. You, and so, the so the, exactly. So there are folks, for example, and I, I'm not, I don't know the answer with, with the carbon fiber, actually, but with plastic bracing, most orthotists can, can put any, you give them a design, they can put it on. So we have folks with steelers emblems on them and all sorts of stuff, and that, that just floats their boat, and they're excited about it, and that's what they want to do, you know, or blue or whatever colors they want. At Dynamic Bracing Solutions, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the reason why we have a black one is it hides pretty well, actually, un, under clothes, whatever, but 
Uh, the other is that that's carbon graphite. Very strong, very lightweight, and if you were to nick this, it shows black. So we have people that do paint, and you, they could be painted any color you want. But if you nick it, then you see black specks that can be touched up, though. But yes, you, you can, we have people that do paint there. And especially the users, if you're gonna get a, I mean, it just, it, if you're gonna, gonna be getting a carbon fiber brace, you're more likely to be a, a higher end user in terms of somebody who's gonna really be valuing from that level of support. So yeah, the folks who are, are wearing either the, the Townsend brace or, or the, the, uh, the, the dynamic bracing solutions are, are folks that are likely to nick them because they're, that, that's, that's the level of person they are in terms of being aggressive towards life. Yeah. I, I'd like to add a couple of things. These, uh, the Townsend, is a, they have two versions. They have a powder-coated style. You can see it's got a texture to it. That's the same coating that's on appliances. And it's available in several different colors. Uh, this this uh, is, you can have any color you want, but it underlying, just like Marmaduke was saying, it is black. But you can get any color. But the thing, what you're talking about is, it, is are they going invisible? What, what direction? They're not actually, I mean, it's more going towards uh, like 3D printing where it's a style and it's almost artistic looking is the direction they're going. So it kind of matches that person's personality with their brace or prosthesis. So Prost not invisible, yeah. Yeah, it's going the other way actually, so. You just reminded me, I've got a, uh, uh, a, a young fellow with, uh, with uh, uh, spastic cerebral palsy and he's in a power chair and he's got um, bilateral braces and, 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 and he is a Penguins fan, and and uh, and 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 he is a Caterpillar fan, and he and, and when he was very young, he went down and Caterpillar actually actually goes down every year. They get him on these like huge, and and so he's got a pair of braces that 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 are the black and gold, and his his power chair looks like it was made by Caterpillar. <laughs> uh, it is just amazing, and that's his personality. And, and, and you talked about, he'll talk about using, I mean, he's driving these just, yeah. have you ever watched like Mega Machines, you know? <laughs> ever seen those things? Yeah. And he gets in and, and, and he drives a power chair and he's really good at that. So he gets on and he can use these joysticks and they have half the company watching him do this because he's so good at using joysticks. Anyhow, the point is that's part of him and he's incorporated that into his life and now it's his braces, it's his, his wheelchair and he just has fun with it. So. I I do have a company that can uh, uh, airbrush anything you want on the brace, flames, you know, whatever you may want, but uh, it is possible. Yeah. Is there another question over here? Okay. Thank you so much. I, I hope this was helpful.